Hello, everyone. I'm Jayshree Bhatt, the Assistant VP for Professional Education and Workforce Development at UTRGV. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to Sustainable Table, the free webinars hosted by the Campus Food Security Initiative team. The purpose of these webinars is to build a network of people in our community that have special interest in health and well being derived from nature. To accomplish this, we plan to invite experts in plant based nutrition and locally grown produce to share relevant information with our community. Our goal is to engage, educate, and empower people with the knowledge they need to make informed choices for their health and well being. I want to thank everyone who joined us today to learn more about this week's topic local honey. Our main speaker this week is Mr. Glenn Simpson, the beekeeper. He has an interesting professional background and will briefly share his story before getting into the topic of discussion. Some of you who joined our webinar last week have been introduced to Ms. Levy Salinas. I have requested her to host this session as she has done some extensive work in promoting local honey and has developed in-depth in knowledge about the benefits of local honey. So take it away, Levy. Thank you, thank you, Jay, and thank you everyone for taking the time to come here today and especially for Glenn to share his knowledge about bees. It's very exciting. I think uh, when you have an interest in local food, local food security, and uh, we all kind of come together uh, naturally. So I think it's it's great to are going to be hosted. If everyone else can keep their mic muted, let's see. Your voice output needs to change a little bit. You need to be a little louder, Labby. Okay, yeah. great. I, I want to make sure everyone could hear me. Okay, thank you for that. So again, we want to introduce uh, Glenn Simpson, who is a local beekeeper and has uh, extensive knowledge of, of beekeeping. Not only does he, um, you know, keep bees, but he also helps and is passionate about teaching other people to become beekeepers if that's so that we can have more beekeepers throughout our the valley because a local honey has so many benefits. So Glenn, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming on. Um, I'll let you tell them more about your background and what got you interested in beekeeping. Well, thank you, Levy. It's really a privilege for me to be here. We're having a little bit of a sound issue, but we're working on it as we go. Uh, I started beekeeping back in 1967 as a 4-H club project when I was uh, in uh, elementary school. I know everybody thinks, well, but, you know, you couldn't have been born back then, but uh, <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, and it was really fun. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Uh, it, it was really, they're really very interesting little creatures. But life got in the way. I went off to college and then the corporate world and then entrepreneurship. And I never had bees again. Well, a few years ago, I retired and I thought, finally, I've got the time I can devote to becoming a beekeeper again. And I want to keep bees. So I was going to have two hives in my backyard. Well, my first year was an absolute disaster because I thought that I could pick up where I left off, but I didn't realize and I didn't do the research that I should have done. But there have been a tremendous amount of changes in the pests, diseases, and uh, problems that we have in raising honeybees between 1967 and the late uh, 2000s, uh, 2015 area. So I started trying to find out, okay, what do I do? This is a disaster. So I reached out to find if there was a local beekeeping organization in the Valley and there basically wasn't an active one. Uh, and I found a group out of Corpus Christi, the Coastal Bend Beekeepers Association that also realized there was a, um, a lack of service and support for beekeepers in the Valley. So we kind of, hooked up and I was doing a lot of research on my own and between the help of uh, 
the Coastal Bend Beekeepers, we started a beekeeping organization now, which is one of the best places to go for people to learn to become beekeepers. But um, there was still a lot to learn. And so I'm constantly researching and reading. Uh, there's been some great uh, research that was done back in the 70s, and I try to read all the books I can. Uh, I've met some really great professors that have, uh, are really the leaders in, in research on honeybees and different aspects of it. Uh, and it's, it's really nice to work with uh, both the academic community and beekeepers to help increase my knowledge and be able to share what I learn with others that are interested in beekeeping. So here I am. I now have over 30 hives. Um, it's gotten a lot bigger than I ever wanted to, and I'm spending a lot of time trying to um, develop better ways in the Rio Grande Valley to, uh, to become a beekeeper and manage the bees because we do have a few unique challenges down here that we don't have in the rest of the United States. And so what would those challenges be compared to other areas? Well, uh, one of the big problems is the uh, Africanized bees. In uh, 1990, the Africanized uh, honeybees, which were a mistake, a research gone wrong down in uh, Brazil, in 1990, they reached the United States and the first place to cross into the US was in Westlaco, Texas. So once again, the valley gets to be number one we introduced Africanized bees to the United States. Uh, that was kind of, that and a couple of other things, including Varroa mites, which are from China that have infested bees, uh, are infesting bees all over the world. Um, between that and the Africanized bees, it put an end to hobby beekeeping in the Rio Grande Valley because nobody knew how to deal with it. The Africanized bees were so much different than the European bees that everyone was accustomed to working with. And it, um, it, it just, there was no resources. And there was no way to really learn how to maintain hobby beekeeping. And a lot of the commercial operations moved away from the valley. Once upon a time, the valley was a very large honey producer and it was very important to the entire uh, beekeeping uh, industry. Mm -hmm. But because of the problems with the varroa mites and the um, Africanized bees, it, the area was not totally abandoned, but it no longer became economically viable to, uh, to raise bees down here. And it wasn't socially viable because of the danger of the Africanized bees. One of the things people don't really realize is that a bee only stings you for one of three reasons. So it's either to protect your, themselves, their family, or their home. The same reason anybody would tend to, uh, to sting you. Uh, I know I would, but the difference in the Africanized bees and the European bees is that most of the European bees, especially the Italian bees have been chosen for thousands of years through selective breeding to recognize certain characteristics as threats and things that happen in their environment not to be a threat. Where the evolution of the Africanized bees was that they had to protect themselves against all natural threats. And to them, that meant just about anything is a threat to them, their home and their family. So it's how they have been selected and evolved over the years that determines how they react, whether they think pushing a lawnmower down the, in the yard is a threat or whether they think that actually picking the hive up and mashing a bee is a threat. I know the bees I raise, I pick, I wear shorts, t-shirt and chanclas to, to work my bees. I don't even wear a, a veil most of the time because of the genetics that those bees have. They're very docile. Mm, very interesting. So, you know, um, a lot of people on the call may be, you know, kind of thinking, well, you know, why, why should we care about bees? You know, what are, why are bees so important? I mean, you and I know, 
but some people don't really understand uh, the role that bees play. Could you explain to the audience a little bit more about that? Well, when I'm doing presentations, uh, and I've talked about this subject, one of the questions I usually ask is how many people like chocolate? How many people like coffee? If it wasn't for commercial beekeeping, we would not have those items in the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. They would be basically just a local commodity for the, the people that uh, raise them. They, they really wouldn't have volumes enough to service the, the industry and service the food industry. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's a, a, an issue there too between native pollinators, native bees, and the European bees, which are introduced here. But without having bees in general, both native and uh, uh, domesticated, we would basically have a crash in our ecosystem. Uh, not only is it important for food, but for the trees to produce seeds, for the flowers to produce seeds. They all you know, need some type of pollination. And there are many of these species that are totally dependent on insects to pollinate their flowers. So there's a lot of things that are that's critical. One of the things too that's important about honeybees is the products that the bee themselves produce. Many native tribes and over you know centuries uh, bee products have been used in the medical field. It hasn't been until recently that mainstream medicine is, to, is starting to pick up on some of the benefits of honey. Um, it's an antibacterial, it's antifungal, it's antiviral. Because of the enzymes and the nature and the, the chemical structure of honey, it actually is designed to fight all of these things. Uh, the bees produce it naturally to help protect themselves and their food but it also will protect us and help our bodies. You know, a lot of the old wives' tales about a spoonful of honey uh, will cure you. It, it actually, in many cases, will. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the areas of research that's been done and is becoming commonly used is for wound protection and wound healing. Uh, I had a friend here in Brownsville that was bitten by a brown recluse and had a terrible wound and they were trying everything and antibiotics and it got infected and it wasn't healing. Finally, the doctor said, told my friend, he said, I'm going to totally change the course in which I'm treating this. So he stopped everything else and he started putting this sticky stub substance and a bandage on it. And he came back every other day to change it. And it started healing very quickly. My friend said, doctor, what is that? And the doctor took his finger and dipped in it, went like that. He said, it's honey. So they use meta honey. It's, it's grown in very clean conditions, uh, but honey actually repairs wounds. It protects it from infection. Um, it also will work in your body systemically to have some degree. One of the things that's beneficial is the pollen from certain areas. If you have had environmental allergies, uh, many times that environmental allergy is due to some type of pollen. Uh, I haven't seen the research on this, but it's reported that if you obtain local pollen, then and ingest it on a regular basis, it'll help build your Im immunities. The same philosophy as giving yourself small doses of an allergen to help you create your own immunities in your body. You know, you get your little shots. It uh, supposedly does the same thing. The only problem is commercially, most of the pollen that we can buy in the United States comes from China. And unless you're living in a specific region in China, it's really not going to give you the benefits that it would be if it came locally. The downside is from a beekeeper standpoint, it's not really economically feasible to produce pollen because it takes so much work. I mean, hand work, it has to be collected every day and it has to all be done by hand. It's just too labor intensive uh, for what the market price is when China is selling it so cheap. And it's the people don't perceive the difference. 
So it's an, kind of an educational thing too. Uh, there's many other things that bees produce that's beneficial. One of the products is propolis. It's, we call it bee glue. It's kind of a brown sticky substance that the bees collect from the sap of trees. And they use it to seal the uh, cracks or any kind of uh, environmental openings they have to the outside so they can manage the temperature and humidity and things like that. They also will coat the entire inside of their hive uh, that they develop. And one of the major components of propolis is its antibacterial and antifungal properties. And if you think about it, the bees want to protect themselves from getting sick. They want to protect their young. Uh, they want to protect their food. And over you know, the evolutionary time of the bee, that's how they've selected to do it. Well, there's many places now, especially in South America, where they're starting to use propolis and also in Asia, where they use propolis to help with different uh, uh, med medical conditions. And it seems to be quite productive. Uh, it's an area I wish we really had a lot more research. Wow. Well, maybe we can start doing some more research here locally with yeah. our university. And, 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 uh, I'm sorry. Okay. There's, I think there's a, <clears throat> there's a backdrop. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. That's sorry. better. I said, maybe we can start doing some uh, of our research here, more here with the university and, and get back into honey, build that area up. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that would be fantastic. I really hope they, they do. Um, one of the other things that uh, I personally am doing, I was looking into uh, for the last couple of years into uh, infusing honey with, uh, with different things, not just for flavoring, but for you know, health benefits. Uh, I was looking at how to infuse it with CBD, which was, you know, a big rage. Uh, but I wasn't really comfortable with what I uh, was learning because most, uh, it has to do with the sol solubility of CBD. It's a fat soluble or an oil product. Well, honey is not, you know, honey is hydroscopic. It uh, is a, a product that's totally water soluble. And that's why it benefits our bodies so much is because water soluble products actually are absorbed very quickly and get into our body uh, in the early part of our digestive system. Well, I ran into some guys and at a conference that actually were in Edinburgh and they're producing a water soluble mm -hmm. CBD. Uh, so I thought, well, this is interesting. So I started working with those guys and we have a water soluble honey where we use water, I mean, water soluble CBD infused honey. Um, one of the other things that we developed after that is say, okay, we've got this patented chemical process. What other things can we try? What, can we take other fat soluble molecules and make them water soluble through this process? Well, it turns out the next thing we tried was melatonin, which helps people sleep. Um, and we st we've had trials, you know, small trials, and we have uh, a lot of people that are saying, okay, hey, I have trouble going to sleep. Well, the products, if you take drugs, they want you to get a full night's sleep. So they tend to last a long time. And then when you wake up, you're kind of groggy. Well, with the water soluble products, you can take it, it gets into your system very quickly, but it also gets out of your system. Now, my wife was my first guinea pig. She owns a preschool, which is a very stressful thing. She uses honey and we have a lot of honey available for the kids that are over a year, year old to help fight different diseases and colds and things. But she also can go to sleep anytime, anywhere. But she wakes up around 2, 3 a.m. and starts thinking about the kids, starts thinking about what teachers aren't gonna show up tomorrow, what's gonna happen and she couldn't go back to sleep. So here we are trying this out and I thought, well, let's try it. So she'll take a, just a teaspoon, not even a full tablespoon, but a teaspoon of it and she'll go back to sleep in about 15, 20 minutes. And yet in about three to four hours, she wakes up 
and she's wide awake. So this whole idea of developing water soluble products that you can infuse honey with and take advantage of the synergies between honey and its properties and also infuse it with something to enhance it, which is what the CBD is doing. Um, there's some real potential there. Uh, we started to do this and thinking, well, it's going to be a dietary supplement that we could sell locally and all. Well, it goes beyond that. And to use honey as the vehicle to, to deliver other medically beneficial natural products uh, is something I'm really excited about and very interested in. That is real exciting. That's real exciting. Can't wait to hear more as those things develop. That's really great. Uh, but definitely, you know, honey has so many health benefits, you know, like you were mentioning. And there's also some studies, and we'll share with the group, you know, that they have, that you, they can find on, um, on uh, PubMed Central that shows that honey can also, not just like for sore throats and things, but there's even studies that say that it can help lower your cholesterol. It can help lower um, uh, your, um, you know, your, the healing properties we were talking about, you know, for burns and things like that. But there's so many antioxidants that honey has, you know, so it can also help the arteries, you know, uh, dilate. And so it, it, there's, so many things that they can have. And now possibly with our, you know, medical school, we can possibly start doing some more research on, you know, those aspects and kind of expound more on it. So that's real exciting. Um, honey can also lower triglycerides and there's some studies on that. So there's actual studies that showed um, from the cholesterol and even lowering blood pressure. Uh, so there are several studies on there like that, that we can, we can kind of share with the group. So like you said, the old uh, tale of just take a spoonful of honey a day really does have some health benefits. And I can tell you from, from myself, that's kind of how I got started with my interest in, of honey, because when I moved down to the Valley, there were, I had tons of allergies, you know, and it was season, seasonal. It, I had just moved here, so I wasn't used to this area. And someone said, oh, just take local honey. So I went back a long time ago and found an actual beekeeper oh. and I had the local honey. And if it wasn't for me experiencing that myself, I thought, wow, this really does have, um, does work. And I don't have seasonal allergies anymore. I live fine here in the Valley. And I also had a lot of digestive issues. And so, um, the taking the honey every day also helped with the digestive issues. So um, honey is a big deal, but I'd like you to share with the group, you know, why it's important when we say local honey, that's my big pet peeve. Everybody calls things local honey or they'll be selling it, you know, and they're calling it local honey. What's really local honey? And why is that important for us to know what we're I would say know your know your farmer but also know your beekeeper Can you share with us about that well the uh, there's no legal definition of local honey so the people that make the labels and that sell the honey can put local honey on anything they want to that's where what you mentioned right now is I think is very important is to know a beekeeper um, there are many people that sell honey that uh, say it's local honey and even pretend to have bees, but they don't. If, if the person selling you the honey is not willing to take you out to see their bees, then they're probably not a beekeeper. But what truly makes local honey and the intent of taking local honey and selling local honey is that it comes from plants that you are exposed to on a regular basis the plants that you have developed your allergy for. The honey itself, one of the things that bees do, we always see pictures of bees with their pollen sacs with pollen on it. The pollen that's mixed with the honey that comes from the plants that you're allergic to is what really helps with your immunities. Um, I've tried to be careful not to, to lead people to think that I'm saying this is going to cure everything, take more honey. But that's because the research is developing 
but there's really not a lot of definitive studies that say this has been tested by so many people and so many projects. There's a lot of research that's really indicating it does, but you have to be exposed to the pollen that comes from your environment. Uh, the bees use the pollen as the protein source for the baby bees. That's why they collect so much of it. It goes into the food that they feed to the larva to develop into bees. Uh, but they also, like they have been, they, they produce excess honey, they also produce excess pollen. And the pollen and the honey are typically in the same frame that you extract when you go to extract the honey. That's how the pollen and the honey get mixed. The pollen isn't necessarily mixed with the honey in the cell. So as the bees are out in your local environment collecting the pollen and nectar from your flowers and they put them in the, in the different cells, when you go to harvest the honey, it gets mixed. And that's how you get the honey that's important for your individual needs is to get the honey that has that pollen from the local plants mixed with the, the honey. Excellent. And so, you know, as a health coach and the Fujicator, I've always been interested in trying to connect people with local um, foods and local sources. So I'm real excited to um, let the audience know that uh, Glenn will now be at the farmer's market once a month here in McAllen at the Thrust Lagos farmer's market. So we'll have actual access to an actual local beekeeper uh, <laughs> that we can say it's really local, local. Yeah. And that's real exciting. And that'll start uh, the first Sunday of every month uh, there at Tres Lagos Farmer's Market from, um, I believe it's from two to five o'clock. Uh, so it right now, of course, with COVID, we're not able to do actual test sampling there, but Glenn is going to have actual to-go samples that you can take so you can taste honey. I always get told, you know, people when we would, I was selling some of my beekeepers uh, honey before at the market, they'd always go, oh, I don't like honey. And they'd pass by the table and I go, really? Well, would you like a sample? And then they taste the honey and they'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so good. It was not what they were used to, the commercial, like you said, a honey at the store. So I think it's real important that people really, before they say they don't like honey, they actually taste honey like from a beekeeper like Glenn, right? Well, oh, thank you. But yeah, uh, most beekeepers are really proud of what they do and they really like to show off. So I am one of those. Uh, that's why I enjoy doing tours and taking people to see the bees and really teaching them about the behavior and where the honey comes from and how it all works, because I think it's important. Um, I did a little, uh, my son did a little uh, video on the harvesting process last year. It's usually a big party where we've had friends come over and everybody gets together and we harvest and bottle all at the same time. But it is important to get to know your beekeeper. We are building a group of local hobby beekeepers and what they call sideliners that are moderately sized beekeepers in the valley. Uh, COVID kind of threw a monkey wrench into that. We were going along good, it was growing fast. Uh, when we come out on the other side, uh, we're doing some things as we go along to try to make that even stronger and to get more people involved. Uh, and we do two types of things. One is we teach people about bees, different types of bees, native bees, and different aspects of bee and bee behavior for people that want to learn, but they don't want to necessarily become a beekeeper. And then we also try to help people learn to become beekeepers. Oh, that's real exciting. That is so, so exciting. So, you know, um, we hear a lot of things about that the bees are dying and that we have to save the bees. Can you share with the audience what, what all that you hear about? Okay. Yeah, uh, part of that the problem with that story is the news media only presents sound bites. So you have to tell an entire complex dynamic story in 10 seconds or less. Now, the truth is because of the Varroa mites, and the viruses that they carry. Uh, we've had a 
tremendous problem with the loss of honeybees mm -hmm. in our environment, not just the feral bees that are actually exotics to, the, to our environment, but also the beekeepers themselves. And sometimes we'll lose anywhere from 30 to 50% of our bees every year. The other part of that story is though, because and mostly the pollination industry in California is the justification for it, but because it's economically feasible to do so, we've had a large industry of queen producers as companies that do nothing but raise queens for beekeepers. And what we do is we'll take our hives in the spring, what have made it through the winter, and we'll feed them really heavily and we'll split them. So for, let's say we lost 30% of our hives, we can go through in the spring and split, you know, over half of our hives in from one hive to two and put a new and add a new queen and they can be operational and ready to do pollination and collect honey uh, within about two to three months. So the other side of the story is yes, it's devastating. We're losing honeybees right and left, but we also have no net loss of colonies because we're able to increase those colonies in order to offset those losses. Now, as long as the economics stay the same, beekeepers will do that. If the economics change, then that's where the potential threat truly is, is that uh, we can't afford to do it and they're not gonna be able to. Let me address another aspect of your question that has really concerned me, is with the introduction of the exotic pests like varroa mites and a few others and small hive beetles uh, and the viruses that they carry, they're starting to see some of those diseases and those pests to their jumping species. So, they're starting to get into and have gotten to some degree into our native pollinators. Uh, as beekeepers, we can do splits and buy queens and do all that to help increase our total colony population, but we can't really do that with the native bees, the mason bees and carpenter bees and all the other little uh, really nice native pollinators we have. So. One of the things that I've been trying to work with, working with the zoo here in Brownsville and uh, some others to try to really promote people to develop habitats to help protect some of our native pollinators. Because the, uh, it, we may be able to maintain our food, but without the native pollinators, we'll start to lose some of our, we have the potential of losing some of our native plants. So when you start talking about the bees and losing the bees, I'm not as concerned about the honeybee losses as I am our native pollinator loss. Wow. So is there, are there any other questions that anyone else has uh, that they would like to ask a beekeeper? Uh, you can put your message in the chat or I am watching also the Facebook Live. You can, if you're watching Facebook Live, you can also post your question on there and we'll be able to um, get the answer for you right now. Take advantage while you have a beekeeper here with us. Um, I know one of the questions that people always ask are like, do you get stung? And how many times have you gotten stung like in a, in a, in a, um, at one time? Well, the most I've been stung at one time, I'm going to estimate to be around 60 to 70 stings. Wow. Wow. When I first started getting back into beekeeping, like anyone else, I didn't have any immunities to the, to the venom. And I would get stung on the back of my hand and I'd swell all the way up to my shoulder. That's wow. just a natural reaction. That's not necessarily a dangerous allergy. It's just a reaction to it. Now, with my bees, I, as long as it's just the, my uh, managed bees, I'll get stung maybe two or three times on the fingers or hands, and within a couple of hours, you can't even tell. There's no swelling, it goes away. One of the side benefits too, when I retired, I had quite a bit of arthritis in my hands. Very stiff, limited mobility, a lot of pain. Well, 
Uh, I'd always heard that beekeepers don't have arthritis, and I thought that's just an old wives' tale. Well, the reality <laughs> is, is it didn't change the defiguration of my hands, but boy, they're they're very flexible. I don't have the pain, so there's something to the the venom therapy. Uh, and that's something I'd like to learn more about. I know in some countries, especially in Asia, it's a common practice for certain problems. So getting stung a lot uh, isn't that uh, isn't necessarily that bad. There are potential medical benefits to that too. Mm -hmm. Wow, I see. I, I have a question, um, Levy. So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I was, this is something he might have covered. Um, so how many times a year do you harvest the, the honey? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on rainfall and temperature and there's so many factors. Uh, in order to get a good bloom or a good honey flow, nectar flow, you have to have a certain amount of rain at certain periods of time and some plants, especially in the Rio Grande Valley, because it has sort of a desert type environment and rainfall, some plants only bloom three to five days after a rainfall. We have a lot of our native trees that do that to produce great honey. Well, if you don't get a significant rain event, you won't get a significant bloom. So typically, if everything's great, we'll harvest two typically two times a year. Uh, I tend to harvest small batches more frequently because I want, I'm, I'm trying to target certain primary plants, but most beekeepers will harvest twice a year. Uh, this past year, we had rain, but it wasn't at the right time for the plants. It was kind of a strange rainfall. We didn't have a very strong winter. Uh, so we didn't have the peaks of rain at the time we needed it. So we had a fairly decent overall flow for the year, but there was no specific spring or fall uh, honey flow. So we basically have not been able to do, you know, keep the honey separate. We basically had to, to just harvest it all at one time. So we only had one harvest this year. Okay, I have a follow-up question to that. So in that case, would it be safe enough to assume that if we've had a rainy, um, you know, climate, or we've had uh, consecutive rainy days, uh, that leads to more blooming and all of that, uh, would would be would it be safe to as assume that the honey would be sweeter? Well, that's a good question. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, honey becomes honey when it reaches 18% or lower moisture content. And the bees bring the nectar in and it's usually very high, a lot of water to it. So the sweetness of it basically is determined by the plant and the bees bring that nectar in and they put it in the cells and they leave it open and a lot of the girls stand around and they flap their wings and they evaporate that moisture off and in the warm weather with the air circulation, that honey continues to dry until they get it right around 18% and then they seal it with the wax. So the honey is going to be whatever that variety of plant is going to have that taste that and that amazing. typical uh, sugar content. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. See, I wouldn't have thought about that. So we have a few questions. Let me ask you. Uh, so they want to know what is the recommended portion of honey to consume every day? Wow, that's a great question. I don't know <laughs> that I have a great answer. As a, as a person selling honey, as much as possible, I think, would be what I'd want to suggest. But um, all I can do in that case is go back to what my grandmother used to do. You know, she was born back in the late 1800s and had bees because that was her only source of sweetener. But she said you should take a tablespoon a day. Uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we became so smart and everything had to be uh, analyzed and all. And I really <laughs> think there needs to be some type of analysis for it. But uh, grandma's remedy seems to be pretty substantial because I know that 
my wife and I use it as a sweetener in tea, especially, and sometimes in coffee. But uh, we also, you know, take about a tablespoon a day. So uh, that's my recommended amount <laughs> and my grandmother's recommended amount. So one of these days, it'd be nice to have some research on that. Yeah. Right. And of course, Jay, if someone is not well, they're going to take more than one uh, table right. vaccine, you know, a day, several times throughout the day. Right. And, you know, um, honey still is sugar, but, you know, it's going to process differently in your, our bodies than sugar. And so it is the less bad <laughs> sugar, you know, for, for spe especially people with diabetics. But definitely, you know, you can go up to five tablespoons a day like when you're sick you know what with, with the sore yeah. throat or something actually you take more so there's someone asking how can we relocate bees that are found around our houses instead of killing them does glenn have an answer for that yes uh it depends on where they are uh it's a lot of work to do removals and relocation uh i do them uh, I'm getting old, it's kind of hard. So uh, there's an actual industry and one of the things from our organization is there's a, a certain contingency that really is doing that as their, their business is to remove the bees. Uh, depending on how to access where they are determines on how much work's involved. But we do go in and we try to save uh, some of the brood so they have an initial brood to draw from. We get them into a managed box and we get them established. Once they get to where the queen's starting to lay eggs and they've got a, a viable colony, then we go in and we pinch the queen and give them a time for everybody to get the memo that they no longer have a queen, so then they're going to be ready. And then we introduce a new queen. Hopefully, we introduce one with the right genetics. Ultimately, our goal when we do this is to save the colony but not the genetics. We replace the genetics of that colony. Um, as far as it, the economics of it, it's a lot easier, a lot more economical for me to just split a hive if I just wanted more bees. But there's, there's a lot more important thing to look at too, is that trying to save the colonies um, are important. Uh, the problem with dealing with Africanized bees in is that they're not really a danger to the other bees as much as they are a danger to people. Uh, and that's why I try to tell everybody, as soon as you see a colony, or even better, if you see a swarm before they move in and become a colony, call a beekeeper, find somebody to collect them and remove them. And we usually do everything we can to try to save those, that colony. Uh, sometimes, if they're inside a concrete column that you can't get to, an exterminator is the only solution. And I hate to see that, but you also have to be practical about what's best for the person that's uh, exposed to them. So someone wants to know if um, where they can purchase your honey from. Is there a website where they can go if they wanna purchase it online or do they have to go to your location? I'm doing, uh, personal sales uh, up to this point. Uh, I do sell to people in the upper valley and the lower valley. Uh, there's some stores that are wanting me to provide uh, my honey and the laws have changed recently that will allow me to do that because um, it's a cottage industry. It's not a commercial industry. Uh, the federal government allowed beekeepers to sell in store, sell wholesale, but State of Texas didn't for a while, but they just have changed that. So we can sell two stores for resale. The problem is the volume. I can get oversold so fast yeah. that I can't produce the honey yeah. that's needed. So the best thing to do if you want to buy my honey, I'm usually at the farmer's market in Brownsville right. on Saturdays. I will be going to the Tres Lagos market, uh, hopefully uh, in January and after that. I also have a Facebook page where most people that I don't know contact me uh, on Facebook and then I make arrangements to deliver it. If it's in the Upper Valley, I'll make a trip to our lab up there, the CBD lab, 
and I'll deliver it when I'm uh, up in that area. So, yes, we, we might be establishing um, a farmer's market type of set in setting in Edinburgh as well soon. So I'm sure that people will get to enjoy that in Edinburgh as well. Um, we might be able to carry your honey at the food co-op. So there's possibilities. Right. So I think that's good. That's good. Somebody posted your uh, Facebook page. Um, yeah, information there. That's great. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else has any uh, questions? We're kind of uh, getting close to the to the hour. I want to make sure that we addressed any other questions that you might have. The, the session will be recorded. We will share. Uh, it'll be posted on the website, uh, the Campus Food Security Initiatives, Initiatives website for any future reference. So um, yeah, so anyone else has any questions, this is the best time to ask it. Uh, uh, Shay, I'll also mention that uh, people were asking about bee removal. There is another bee removal service, yeah. uh, Bee Strong Honey Bee Removal. Right. That's another place they could also call and they can help remove the bees and save those if they're if they're needed. Because like he said, there's not many and he's not able to do it. So yeah. we need to provide those resources out. The Thank Texas Apiary Inspection Service has a list of people and beekeepers register with the uh, Apiary Inspection Service. And they keep a list of people in certain areas that do bee removals. Excellent. So there are, uh, there are several people to, about, uh, around. Also, um, you know, uh, we don't have a referral service locally yet, but um, that's something too that you can contact just about any beekeeper. And if they can't do it, they'll try to refer you to somebody who can. Anyone else? I think Michelle had a question about a way to keep bees out of hummingbird feeder, feeders without hurting them. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Was that a question for me? Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Michelle had a question about a, a way to keep out hum, uh, bees from honey hummingbird feeders without hurting them. Uh -huh. Well, that's always, it depends on the time of year. If the bees have an alternative, they're not gonna fight the birds over the, the hummingbirds, especially over the food. But this time of year, uh, we have that same problem in our backyard. I probably have oh, five, six uh, hummingbird feeders right now. Uh, the best thing to do is to look for a feeder that has some kind of shield, like a, a screen or something that the hummingbirds have to insert their beak through to get to the nectar. If the nectar is fairly close to the surface, the proboscis of the honeybee can reach down in there. And once one of them gets it, they go back to the hive and say, hey guys, I guess what I found. And then everybody's there within a matter of minutes. Uh, so you, it's really a mechanical thing to, to, to make sure you buy a feeder that the birds can get to, but the bees can't actually get their proboscis down into feed. If they can only get just a few drops, the bees will be around it, but they're not going to completely cover the feeder uh, like they will if they can get to it this time of year. Great. So the most intriguing part about the honeys for me is the the queen bee, you know? That is just so interesting how they they basically, they're all there to protect the queen bee. So what is the secret behind that? Or at well, least it seems like it. <laughs> the queen has one job in life and that's to lay eggs. During uh -huh. the summertime, she'll lay between three to 5,000 eggs. Amazing. Uh, it's kind of a misnomer to call her a queen because she doesn't make any decisions at all. <laughs> the, the hive, the, the, the working bees, the, the rest of the hive decides when it's time to swarm, what kind of egg she's gonna lay because she can choose to lay a fertilized egg which will become a worker bee or a female or an unfertilized egg which will become a drone or a male bee. Um, 
the egg isn't fertilized to the exact moment that she actually excretes that egg and deposits it in the cell. The, uh, she doesn't make a decision as to which it is. The worker bees decide and tell her, okay, here's where you're going to put a drone. Here's, these are all workers. Just keep going, mom, keep going. So her job is to lay eggs, but she's so important. If she dies or something happens to her, they lose the colony. Uh, a bee oh, wow. colony is called a super organism. A uh, super organism is just like our body. We have arms that do certain things and eyes that see. And all right, the, the bee colony has a whole lot of individual living parts that perform those same functions. Each bee has a job. Wow. And if any of those jobs don't get done, the body, the colony will die. So they have to protect that queen to make sure she's laying enough eggs so that they will have all the different parts of that body functional at all times. That's why she's so critical. Uh, there's usually, when they be swarm, which is a whole, I could talk for an hour on just swarming. Um, when the bees swarm, they take half the colony and the queen, the existing queen, and move somewhere else, and then they make a new queen. Hopefully they make it in time. Oh, wow. And they usually prepare for it, you know, prepare for how they, they do that. Well, there is a break in the brood cycle, usually a couple weeks. Uh, that is a good way to intervene in the varroa mites because the varroa mites only produce, they reproduce inside the cells with the larva. They feed off the larva as they're growing. So it helps break and it helps that, that break helps diminish the varroa mite problem too. So it's kind of interesting. Swarming behavior is really a kind of a cool thing. So I, you know, Glenn, we'll, we'll look for, uh, we'll go ahead and look forward to getting you to set up a specialized training uh, in spring to show people how to get a beehive started if they're interested. I think that'll be great. It'll be more of a hands-on, I guess. Yeah. Beekeeping we'll is definitely, have to hold it outdoors, right? <laughs> yeah, beekeeping is definitely a, a hands-on experience. Um, I see people say, well, I went to a bee class, so now I can become a beekeeper. Say, no. No. <laughs> it, takes, it takes a couple years to be a beekeeper. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot of people and talk with them that uh, say, oh, I, I know all about it. I've watched YouTube videos. And I say, please do not think you're a beekeeper because you've got a degree from YouTube University. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kiss of death. You get out there and you get the hive and you open it up. And what do I do now? <laughs> um, so you have to have that knowledge. The best way to become a beekeeper is to get to know a beekeeper. Yeah. Take classes, look at YouTube, learn from it. Right. The most dangerous teacher on YouTube is a second year beekeeper because they know everything. <laughs> and it seems like after your second year, you just know less, less and less. It's kind of like being a parent, you know, they'll, you know, or a child, you know, you see your child knows everything there is to know when they're 20, but the same thing's true with second year beekeepers. Uh, so you have to kind of pick and choose. And, and I listen to some now and I just say, don't say that. Don't tell people <laughs> that. That's wrong. Yeah. Uh, but learning to become a beekeeper is very important. And I, I love teaching. Um, I love sharing. I, I, the, the reason I do is because getting the knowledge is hard. Yeah. And I've had to climb some very steep ladders in the last few years. Yeah. And I don't want anybody else to do it. I want to see people that are successful, that are yeah. raising to enjoy it. So yeah, anything I could do like that, I'd be glad, be glad to do it. Yeah. And someone posted, save the Valley Bees. I guess we will be doing that through training <laughs> <laughs> in the future. So I know we're coming up on the hour soon. If, um, if no one else has any questions, uh, we would be winding down. Um, Labi, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share before we end it? Uh, I just want to say thank you again for giving us this opportunity to share with people about, uh, about bees, local food, and food security here. So I think this is just a wonderful platform to bring us together. So we, we honor and thank you so much. And Glenn, you too for your knowledge and your passion yes. to share. 
I, I just think it's really exciting to see um, what's going to go forward from 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 all of this. Thank you. And for those who are on the call right now, just as a reminder, we are going to continue with our um, webinars starting in January in the new year. It might actually become once in two two weeks rather than weekly. I just wanted to do two two weekly this this uh, this month so that we don't lose the momentum, but. We will look forward to bringing a lot more people, experts in different areas of the, um, you know, locally grown, locally uh, sourced type of food products that are sustainable to kind of share that knowledge with the community. We'll look forward to having more people like you all on board starting in January. So those who are on the call today, just as a reminder, these webinars are free and open to the public. So anyone can join. Feel free to share the Zoom link. Feel free to share the information with them. And when we send the email with the two recordings, we, you know, go ahead and share that with your, with your network of people. Let them know that they can come to the website to, to watch what they missed this time because recorded versions will be available on the website. So thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for today's session. Thank you.